Welcome to this YSL tutorial. In this video, we're going to cover using files and folders in Excel VBA. So the video is all about working with the file system of your computer. And we'll start by introducing you to the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Object Library, which is the best way to do this. We'll show you how you can create a new file system object, and then how you can use that to perform basic methods with folders and files, such as creating them and copying them. We'll include there how you can test whether or not a file in a folder exists. Once we've covered the basic techniques, we'll move on and show you how you can loop over all of the files in a single folder, and then to finish off the video, how you can recursively loop over all of the folders and subfolders at a given starting point. So there's quite a lot to do in this video, and there's some fairly complex ideas, but let's get started by introducing you to the scripting runtime library. VBA provides some basic functions for working with files and folders. But if you want access to the full range of things you can do without having to write some fairly convoluted code, the best thing to do is use the Microsoft Scripting Runtime Object Library. And the best way to do that is to set a reference to that library within the VBA project that you're working on. So to do that, head to the Tools menu at the top of the VBA Editor and choose References. In the long list of object libraries that you'll then no doubt find, you need to scroll through the list to find one called Microsoft Scripting Runtime. It's very easy to accidentally scroll all the way past it, as I've just done there, but once you've found it, there it is, make sure you do place a check in the box. As you've seen, it's not sufficient just to click on the name of the library. You must make sure you check the box. And once you've done that, click OK, and you now have access to a whole wonderful world of objects, collections, methods, and properties devoted to working with files and folders. Now the scripting runtime library gives you access to all sorts of new classes of object. And if you wanted to see what they are, you can use the object browser to view them. So to do that, head to the view menu at the top of the screen and choose object browser, or just press the F2 key on your keyboard. And then it's worthwhile filtering the list that appears to showing only those items which belong to the scripting library. So select scripting from the drop down list at the top. Now on the left hand side, you'll see a list of all the individual classes of object you have access to. And one of the top level objects, and almost certainly the most important one for this video, is one called a file system object. If I select the file system object class, on the right hand side now I can see a list of all the methods and properties of that object. One of my favourite things I think about this particular library is just how clearly labelled every single method name is. You can tell at a glance just by looking at the name of something almost exactly what it is going to do. So now that we know that the file system object is quite important, we need to write some code that will create a new instance of that object. So let's close down the object browser and start writing some code to create a new file system object. The first thing we'll do is declare a variable which can hold a reference to our file system object. So let's declare a variable. I'm going to call mine FSO as, and we could just say here file system object. You'll see that it appears in the IntelliSense list because we've referenced the scripting runtime library. Now I always think that it's worthwhile whenever you've referenced another library, preceding the name of its object types with the name of the library itself. So all I mean by that is putting the word scripting first. You see this nice little icon in the IntelliSense list? It looks like a little set of books meant to look like a library. Scripting dot. Now you'll see that the list of classes is filtered to only those items which belong to that library. So I want a scripting file system object, and there's our variable declared. Now we need to create a new instance of that object. So we can do that by saying set FSO equals new scripting dot file system object. And again, the keyword scripting there is optional. You can just say new file system object, but it's the new keyword that's very important. This creates a new instance of that type of object. Now that we've done that, we can access all of the methods and properties of a file system object simply by saying fso dot, and then the IntelliSense list shows you all the things that you can do with files and folders. Now there are a couple of other techniques you can use to create new file system objects. So just before we move on, I'd like to quickly mention what those are. I'm going to start by writing a quick extra subroutine called auto instancing variable. And then I'm going to declare an another variable, dim fso, as, but in this instance, I'm going to put in the new keyword in the variable declaration. So as a new scripting dot file system object. Now essentially what this line of code does is it combines the two lines we've written in the previous subroutine. So it declares a variable which can hold a new file system object. 
This line doesn't actually create the new instance, however. The way this works is that when you use the FSO variable name in your code, when the program is running, the VB editor essentially checks to see if FSO has been set to a new instance of a file system object yet. And if it hasn't, it will automatically create a new instance. So you can just use FSO dot and then choose the method you want to use without having to worry about whether or not you've created a new instance yet. And that sounds really, really convenient that the VB editor essentially takes care of when your new file system object is created. However, there are a couple of small downsides to using this technique. First of all, it's not just the first time you use the variable name FSO that the VB editor checks if it is nothing. Essentially, every single time the VB editor encounters that variable name, it checks to see if it's nothing, then it will create a new instance. And that adds a small overhead to your code, and the more times you use the file system object variable name, the more overhead you'll add. Secondly, and this is slightly less important, but occasionally you might want yourself to test if FSO is nothing, then do something. And of course, with an auto instancing variable, that statement can never return true, because every time the VB editor encounters FSO, it checks itself whether or not it's nothing, and if it is nothing, then it creates a new instance. So this statement will never, ever, ever return true. So auto instancing variables are kind of convenient shortcuts to do things we can do in two separate lines, but there are one or two small downsides to using them. So if you are going to use this technique, please do be aware of the small downsides to using it. Now the two techniques we've looked at so far both rely on us having set a reference to the scripting runtime library. Without that, these subroutines will not work at all. So if I head to the tools menu and choose references, and I uncheck the Microsoft scripting runtime reference, you'll see that as soon as I attempt to run either of these two subroutines, they'll fail immediately, saying that it does not recognize what a scripting file system object is. However, there is a way to write code that creates a new file system object without having to have that reference set. And it uses a built-in fun function of VBA called create object. So I'm going to create a quick extra subroutine called using create object. And then I'm going to say dim FSO as object. I can't use file system object anymore because that doesn't exist in the IntelliSense list. Because as you just seen, I've removed the reference to that library. So instead, we just use the generic object. What we can then do is set FSO equal to. And we can't use the new keyword again, because if we were using the new keyword, we'd need to have the scripting runtime library referenced. So what we can do instead is use a built-in function of VBA called create object. And the create object function has got two parameters, but there's only one that we need here, it's called class. And that requires a string of text. So essentially the class that I'm creating the name of the class that I'm creating is what I had in here earlier on, scripting.filesystemobjects. In fact, I'm just going to copy and paste this into this subroutine. And because that's entered as a string of text, the VB editor doesn't need to um, interpret that when it compiles the project. So now I can happily run this subroutine and everything will work normally. You'll see I don't fail with a compile error, whereas these ones still do. So this one works normally. However, there is one big disadvantage of having the create object method. Because I haven't referenced the scripting runtime library, if I type in FSO dot, I don't get any IntelliSense. So I kind of need to know intimately every single method that I can use and exactly how they work. So um, for that reason, we're going to stick to referencing the scripting runtime library. And in my case, I'm also going to stick to the non-auto instancing variables. We're going to explicitly state when we're going to set our FSO variable to a new instance of that type of object. So one last little thing I need to do, back to the tools menu and choose references. And then scroll through the list to find Microsoft scripting of runtime again. I've gone past it again. I always do that. Check the box. Click OK. And now we're ready to write some useful code. So now that we've created our new file system object, let's have a look at some of the simple methods we can use. We'll start by looking at how to create a new folder. And I can do that by saying FSO dot, and then it's usually a case of just guessing the name of the method. And in this case, it's really straightforward. It's create folder. If I type in a space after that, you'll see it has a single compulsory parameter called path a string. So essentially, this is the name of the folder that I want to create. It's full entire path. 
So the folder that I want to create is going to be sitting on my desktop. If I quickly show you a Windows Explorer window, I want it to be called Wise Owl, and I want it to sit in this particular location. So a quick neat way to cheat here is to use the title bar, the address bar of the Windows Explorer window, to copy the existing path so far, and then paste that directly into the VB editor. So inside is a double goats, paste in that path. Then I can tag on a backslash to the end of that, and then the name of the new folder that I want to create. And that is essentially all I need to do. I'm going to add one more extra line of code here as well, a couple of lines further down. I'm going to say set FSO equals nothing. This is essentially the opposite of what we're doing when we're creating a new instance of a file system object. This releases the object, it destroys or terminates it, and frees up any memory space taken up by it. Now in VBA you don't have to do this, because when n sub is reached, any variable which is locally declared to the subroutine is terminated anyway. So I don't have to do this, but it's good practice to release your variables as soon as you finish with them. So having done all that, if I run this subroutine, everything seems to work, and if I quickly check back in my Windows Explorer window, there's my new folder, Wise Owl. Now one small problem with this subroutine would have been if we tried to run it and this folder already existed, it would have failed. And I can prove that because the folder already exists. If I run it again, we get a runtime error saying that the file already exists. And it's fairly obvious which lines cause the problem. If I hit debug, it's the one that creates that folder. So it would be nice if I could test if the folder already exists before I attempt to create it. Unfortunately, the file system object gives us a simple way to do that. I'm going to write an if statement above this instruction. I'm going to say if fso dot, then there's a wonderful function here called folder exists. If I open some parentheses, you can see again it's got a single compulsory parameter, um, folder spec as string. So again, it essentially wants the path of the folder that I'm testing for. So again, I'm going to copy and paste this, and then close the parentheses and type in then. Now, I don't want to test if the folder does exist. What I really want to do is test if the folder does not exist. So I'm going to tag the not keyword into my if statement. So if not folder exists, then I'd like to create it. Indent that code just to tidy things up a bit and tag on end if towards the end. So once I've done that, I can run the subroutine as many times as I like, and it will only create the folder now if it doesn't already exist. If I use the F8 key to step through, You'll see at this point, if I run it, it steps over that line because the folder does exist. If I just go back to the, the Windows Explorer window and delete that folder, and then head back to the VB editor and step through again using the F8 key, you'll see that this time it does execute that instruction because the folder does not exist. So there we go. When we're writing code involving files and folders, you tend to find that the same folder path or file path pops up again and again and again in the same subroutine. So rather than rewriting or copying and pasting this multiple times, what would be a more sensible idea would be to store this path in a simple string variable. So let's just tidy up our routine by adding that in now. I'm going to declare a new variable called new folder path. Um, and in there, I'm going to store the name of that folder path. So I'm going to store it as a string. And I'm going to simply say new folder path equals and then copy and paste that string. What I can do then is replace any reference to that literal string with my variable new folder path. So replace those two with new folder path, and that makes life much, much easier when we're running this code. So if I hit run to run it, it will create the folder if it needs to, or avoid creating it if it already exists. One other neat little thing that we can do while we're talking about storing the folder path in a string variable is what if I wanted to make this routine run regardless of which user was running the code? So obviously if somebody else was running this, this subroutine, they wouldn't be logged in as andrew.gould. So fortunately, VBA provides us with a function that will pick up on the current user profile. And the function is called Enviro, and you may have seen it used in a couple of our other videos previously. If I just show you briefly how it works by viewing the immediate window, we can question or query the, uh, the immediate window to say Environ, and the parameter I want to pass in is user profile, or the argument I want to pass into the, uh, the parameter. If I hit enter, can you see that that returns essentially the first part of the folder path that I'm trying to generate, everything up to andrew.gould. So what I can do instead here is 
remove that part from my new folder path variable and simply concatenate onto the beginning of that the result of environ user profile. Excuse me, spell user profile properly. I should have just copied and pasted it, shouldn't I really? Um, so concatenate with an ampersand and that will generate the complete folder path. But it will work so that whoever is logged in um, to Windows at that point, the, the folder will be created on their own desktop. So again, if I just run through this again, it works happily. Now that we've successfully created a folder, what I'd like to do is copy a file from another folder into that new one. And just to quickly show you which file that is, if I head back to the Windows Explorer window, there's another folder sitting on the desktop called VBA Files. And in there is a folder called Files for Course. And in there, there's a file called characters.xlsm. And that's the file that I would like to copy. I'm going to need to know the name of the folder which that file currently exists in. So while I'm here, I'm going to copy that file uh, folder path. Then I can head back to the VB editor and give myself a couple of blank lines before I hit uh, set FSO equals nothing. And then it's a case of typing in FSO dot and then pretty much just guessing again which method we need to use. And hopefully again, this one's fairly obvious. It's the copy file method. If I type in a space after copy file, you can see it's got uh, two compulsory and one optional parameter. So source a string and destination a string. Source is the full file path of where the file originally exists. So just to make sure that I can show you all this on a single screen with, to avoid having to scroll left and right, I'm going to use the, the continuation characters, space and an underscore. Then I can continue writing this instruction on the next line. It probably also makes sense to name my parameters here as well. So I'm going to type in source colon equals, and then paste in into a set of double quotes the path that I copied earlier on. I just scroll this screen across a little bit so we can actually hopefully make out the whole thing on one single screen width. Now currently all I've got there is the uh, the path of the folder that the file exists in. What I also need to do is tag on the name of the file itself. So I need a backslash and characters dot xlsm. Okay. Now I want to carry on writing this um, this instruction on the next line. So I'm going to type in another space and an underscore and head back to the next line. So at this point, I want to move on to the destination parameter. So I need a comma, then I'm going to name my, my parameter as destination colon equals. And this time, the destination is going to be the new folder path that we created earlier on. So this is a little bit easier. I can just reference my new folder path variable. Now, it's not quite sufficient just to put in the path of the folder you want to copy the file to. The file also has to have a name that it's going to be copied to. So I need to concatenate onto the end of the folder path the name that the file will have. So ampersand, open double quotes, backslash. And I could give the file the same name that it already has, characters.xlsm. But it doesn't need to have the same name. I could actually change that. So it's called, for instance, characters copy or characters backup, for instance. But in this example, I actually want it to have exactly the same name. So I'm going to call it characters.xlsm. Now there's one third optional parameter here. You can see overwrite files as boolean and it has a default value of true. So by default, if that character's file already existed in the YSL folder, it would be overwritten by this copy file method. I'm actually going to leave it as true. That's what I want to happen. If it already exists, I'd like it to, to, be, to be replaced effectively. Okay, so at this point, if I choose to run that subroutine and then go back to the Windows Explorer window, go back to my desktop, look in my YSL folder, I should find that I have a copy of my character's file. Now the copy file method would have failed if the file that we were trying to copy didn't exist. So in the same way that we can test whether or not a folder exists, a file system object provides a way to test if a file exists. And you can probably guess what the name of the method is going to be. And before we do that, I'm actually going to create another folder path variable. I'm going to declare a variable called dim old folder path. Otherwise, I'm going to get bored of seeing the same long string in my subroutine again and again and again. So as string, and then I'm going to set that to be equal to the path of the old folder. So I'm going to say old folder path equals, and then I'm just going to copy this environ user profile ampersand, and then desktop files for course. I'm just going to copy that in as well. 
So in the seven double quotes, close double quotes. So what I can do now is change my source parameter or source argument, I should say, to be equal to old folder path ampersand backslash characters.xlsm. So that makes things a little bit easier to read. Now back to the idea of testing whether or not that file exists in the first place. We can write an if statement above this, which says if fso dot file exists, as you probably already guessed, open instead of parentheses, and what I want to test for is whether this file exists. So again, I'm going to copy and paste. Then indent it just to tidy it up and add endif to the end. So this will now only try to copy the file if that file already exists. So if I run it, we'll see that it works. If I test for a different file name altogether, and I just step through, we'll find that this test fails because that the file called characters2 does not exist, so it won't then attempt to copy it. And I guess we could put an else clause into our statement there, which maybe presents a message to the user telling them that the file copy method didn't work, um, but we'll just leave it as it is for now. We'll just accept that it won't do anything if that file does not exist. And let's replace that so it does actually go back to working again. So hopefully what you're getting from this video so far is that working with files and folders is really simple when you're using file system objects. You can test whether a folder exists or whether a file exists. And there's also wonderfully sensibly named methods that allow you to do things like create a folder or copy a folder or delete a folder or move a folder. And likewise for files, you can copy a file, delete a file or move a file. What I'd like to do next is get into the idea of accessing these objects in a bit more detail. So rather than just performing simple operations on files and folders, what if I want to investigate some extra properties of one of those two types of objects? We'll start by looking at how you can store a reference to a file object and then investigate some of its properties. We'll start by declaring a new variable, which can hold a reference to the file that we're trying to manipulate. So let's declare a new variable at the top called dim fill as a scripting dot file. What I'd then like to do is once I've established whether the file exists, I want to store a reference to it in the fill variable. So I'm going to remove the statement which copies our file previously. We'll replace that with a new method in a moment. Give myself a couple of blank lines in there. And then I'm going to say set fill equal to fso dot get file. So get file is a function which returns a reference to a file object. If I open a set of parentheses after the name, I'll see that it has a single compulsory parameter and it returns a reference to a file class. So the path that I want to get a reference to is the same as the one that I've just established exists. So I can copy and paste that, close the parentheses, and now we have a reference to that file stored in a simple variable. The great thing about that is that we have access to all that file's properties now, simply by saying fill dot, and there's the list of all its properties and methods. So let's print a few of them to the immediate window, see what we get. I'm going to say debug.print, uh, and then fill dot name, comma, fill dot path, comma, fill dot date created perhaps, fill dot date last modified, fill dot type is quite an interesting one. And let's go for one last one, fill dot size. Feel free to investigate the other properties as well. There's many, many other properties you can check and some of them are quite useful, but that will probably do just for the sake of demonstration for now. So if I run that subroutine and then have a look in the immediate window, we should be able to see a whole bunch of different properties available. So let me just scroll down so we can match our property to our value. So fill.name is clearly obviously the, the name of the file, but it also includes the extension of that file name as well. Fill.path is the next one, which gives you the full folder path, but also the file's name at the end as well, including the extension, which is quite important. Uh, we've got then date created and date last modified. So I created the file early on this morning when I copied the folder to my desktop just before I started recording the video. And then we've got date last modified, which is much longer ago. Back in 2008 was the last time somebody modified that file. Then what else have we got? We've got the type of file. So that's quite a nice long descriptive piece of text which explains exactly what type of file it is, not just what type of application it was from, uh, but also what version of that application and also whether it's macro enabled or not in this case for Excel. Finally, we've got the size, which is reported in bytes.
So I'm just going to close the immediate window at this point and think about what we could do with that. Basically, having access to the properties of a file lets you test lots of different conditions about it. So let's say we only wanted to copy this file if its size was greater than 20,000 bytes, for instance. I'm just going to delete the debug.print line altogether. And then we can replace that with another if statement, which says if fill.size is greater than 20,000, then make sure I put in end if. What I'd like to do now is copy the file, but I don't have to rely on the fso.copy file method anymore because the file itself has its own dedicated copy method. So if I say fill.copy, this one's much more simple to use. I don't have to specify the source for the file because it knows where it comes from, it's the file object itself. Um, so all I need to do is specify where I would like it to go. So I want it to go into my new folder path, and then I also need to tag on the file name that I want it to have as well. So if I wanted to call it and um, characters, I could do that. But I don't even need to do that anymore either, because this file knows what it is already called. If I want to give it the same name that it already has, I don't need to explicitly type it out. What I could do instead, as long as I make sure I put in the the folder separator there, so a backslash, I can then concatenate on the file's name as well. So that makes sure that it has the same name when it's copied as it had where it was originally. So if I just give this one a quick test now using F8 to step through, let's get to the uh, the important bit. Fill.size is 15,963 bytes, which is not more than 20,000, so that will fail. I could have again have an else clause there that reports that the file wasn't copied because it wasn't big enough. I'm just going to reset the subroutine at that point. Let's just modify that down to say 15,000, just to prove that it will still work. So if I use FH step through now, this pass, uh, this test will pass now. So it will apply the copy method to that file, and there it goes. And then end the subroutine. So storing a file object in a variable gives you access to all sorts of other interesting and useful properties that you can use in your other if statements. Now that we've seen how to manipulate single files and single folders, let's have a look at doing something a little bit more interesting. What I'd like to do for the next example is loop over all of the files that belong to this folder, the old folder, Files for Course. I want to check if the file is an Excel file, then I want to copy it into my new folder, the YSL folder sitting on my desktop. So to make that work, we need to be able to loop over the files in a folder. Let's get back to the VB editor, and I'm going to declare another new variable at the top. It's going to be a variable which will hold a folder object. I'm going to call it dim old folder as scripting.folder. What I'm then going to do is remove this entire if statement which works with our single file. We're not going to need that at all. So I'm going to take that whole thing and remove it. What I'm then going to do is check whether my old folder exists. And if it does, I want to get a reference to it. And I'm going to do that above the if statement that I've got, which checks whether my new folder exists. So I'm going to say if fso dot folder exists, open brackets, old folder path, then set old folder equal to fso dot get folder. I need to pass in the path again, so that's old folder path. And then I'm going to indent this if statement altogether and add in my end if just towards the bottom there. So basically everything that happens in this entire subroutine now is going to be dependent on whether or not my old folder exists. Because of course I only want to start looping over its files and copying them if it's actually there. So we've seen this if statement before, we, we make sure that we create the new folder, whether it whether if it doesn't exist, and if it does exist, then just ignore it. What I can do then, once I've established that that folder does exist, I can start looping over the files in my old folder. Now if you've seen our video on looping over collections of objects, you'll be very familiar with the, uh, the construct we're about to create here. We're going to say for each fill in old folder dot files. So it's looping over a collection of objects. Give ourselves a couple of blank lines and then say next fill. And then we can decide what to do inside that loop. Just to begin with, all I'm going to do is debug.print. Try that again, debug.print fill.name. 
So just to show you what that will do if I display the immediate window again, Control and G on the keyboard or view immediate window, then I'm going to select all the text in it by pressing Control and A and hit delete to remove it. Then I'm just going to click back inside this subroutine and I'll begin stepping through using F8. Just get to my loop. So here we are, the first file will be printed and so on and so on and so on. At this point I'm just going to hit the, uh, the run button to run all the way through to the end or press F5. And that will list out all of the files which belong to that folder. Now I want to break this down so I, that I only perform an action on the Excel files. And all of the Excel files will have the first two letters of their extension name as XL. So just close down the immediate window to give myself a bit more space. I'll just remove my debug.print statement as well. What I could do is I could use some text functions in Excel. There are, there's the right function, the left function, which allows you to return characters from the right and the left of a string of text. But it can be quite awkward to, uh, to work out exactly how many characters I want to get, because as we've seen, different, um, different versions of Excel files have different numbers of letters in their name. Ideally, I'd like to be able to return everything from the right-hand side at the full stop, but that can be quite awkward depending on how many full stops you have in the overall file name. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to rely on yet another file system object technique, where it's a, it's a method or a function called get extension name. So I'm going to say if fso dot get extension name open parentheses and then I can say the path of the file that I want to test for. Now I can do that by using the file object variable fill dot path and I want to check if that is equal to let's say let's just say xls for now then give myself a couple of blank lines and type in end if and inside the if statements I'm just going to use another debug dot print uh, fill dot name. So again, just to prove that it, that it is excluding the non Excel S files this time. So if I display the immediate window again, Control and G, Control and A to select everything and then delete. I'm just going to run this subroutine again from start to finish. And this time we'll see it only returns the XLS files. And that wasn't quite what I wanted. What I actually wanted was all of the Excel files, regardless of which version they were created in. So what I'm going to do here is I am going to use the left function. I'm going to say if left, open parentheses, fso.getExtension name fill.path. After that I can type in a comma. Then I have to say how many characters I want to get from the left of that string of text. And I'm going to go for just two characters here, close parentheses, and then test if those two characters equals xl. So once again I'm just going to clear the immediate window and then click into the subroutine again and run it one more time and this returns a list now of all of the Excel files essentially every file whose extension begins with the two letters XL. So I've established that I'm working with the correct list of files all I want to do now is rather than print out their names I want to copy them to a new folder so let's just clear the immediate window by closing it down and replace the debug.print line with the statement that will actually copy the file we've already seen this fill.copy. We have to specify where the file will be copied to and I'm going to put it in the new folder path ampersand open double quotes backslash close double quotes ampersand fill.name. So each file will have the same name when it's copied as it had in its original location. So just back to the Windows Explorer window for a moment and show you the YSAL folder which currently should contain just a single file, the characters file. If I go back to the VB editor and I run this subroutine and then I look back in the YSL folder there's a copy of every Excel file from the original files for course folder. Looping over all of the files in one single folder is potentially quite useful and it's quite a powerful technique as well but what would make this system even better would be if we could tell the subroutine to start looping over the files in one folder but then for it to investigate all of the subfolders within that one and then the subfolders within each of those and so on and so on and so on. So basically instead of just looping over the files in one single folder we could tell it to perhaps start at the VBA files level and look into every single folder within there and look for Excel files and copy those but also if that folder had subfolders then to look into each of those folders as well and to keep on going until it essentially runs out of folders to look into. 
that's a lot more complicated to do, but I think it's certainly worth a shot at, uh, at creating. Um, I'm going to make a few changes, quite a lot of changes in fact, to the code that we've already written. Let's make a start with a simple part. Let's, um, let's change the old folder path so that it's not looking at files for course, it's looking at the more top level VBA files folder. That's nice and simple to do. The next job, because we're going to split this subroutine into two separate parts, I need both parts of the subroutine, essentially both new subroutines, to have access to my file system object variable. So instead of declaring it within the subroutine itself, making it a local variable, we're going to move that towards the top of the, the module so that it's declared as a module level variable. So we've extended its scope so that every subroutine in this module now has access to a file system object. We're only going to create one new instance of that file system object and it's going to be created within this original subroutine. The next thing we're going to do is begin writing the next subroutine that will be part of this system. So down at the bottom of the module, after n sub, I'm going to write a new subroutine called copy Excel files. And this subroutine is also going to have a single parameter, which allows us to tell the subroutine which folder to begin copying Excel files from. So we'll tell it the top level folder to begin at. To do that, we need to open a set of parentheses after the subroutine name and think of a sensible name for our parameter. I'm going to call mine start folder path, sounds like a sensible name, as a string. Close the parentheses and then hit enter to create the n sub. Do that a couple of times and indent the code one space. Now I'm going to take two of the variables that we declared in the previous subroutine and place them into this new one. So scrolling back up to the top, the two variables that I want to take out are the file and the folder object variables. So I'm going to select those and cut them with Control and X and then into the new subroutine. There we go. I'm going to paste them in. I'm also then going to take the line which sets a reference to the old folder from the old subroutine and I'm going to cut that and place that into the new subroutine as well. Now, what I also need to do is change the reference to the old folder path because that's a variable which exists in my first subroutine. It's declared locally to that subroutine, which means it doesn't exist in this one. So instead of using old folder path, I'm going to reference the parameter of this subroutine. So instead of old folder path, I'm going to change that to start folder path. The next thing we'll take from the old subroutine is the loop which processes each file in the given folder. So I'm going to select the entire for each to next fill statement and I'm going to cut that and I'm going to place that into the new subroutine as well. I just need to tidy up my indenting a little bit. So select those statements and press shift and tab and give myself a blank line below. Now one thing I also need to do here is make sure that I have access to the new folder path variable because again that's been declared in the original subroutine which means it's only local to that routine. Now, I've got two techniques I could use here to do this. I could make it a variable whose scope is the module just like I've done with the FSO variable or I could create a second parameter and pass that value into this subroutine via another parameter. I could type in a comma and then declare a new parameter here. Now the new parameter idea is probably considered better programming, but because of the way this subroutine is going to work, I want to make sure that I only pass that piece of information once. So I'm actually going to um, cheat, I suppose, and make this a, a variable whose scope is extended to the level of the module. So I'm going to select new folder path and declare that at the module level instead. Okay, so we're getting there. Now there's just one more line of code I'm going to add in before I attempt to run this pair of subroutines together. What I'll do first is just tidy up a little bit and get rid of a few of these blank lines. So once I've established that the old folder exists and the new folder exists, what I'd like to do is call on my second subroutine to copy all the Excel files into the new folder. So I can do that simply by stating the name of the old, uh, sorry, the, the, the subroutine. So if I press Control and Space to display my IntelliSense list. You'll see that copy Excel files exists as a method in that list. So copy Excel files, follow that with a space. I've got to tell it which folder to start listing my files from or copying my files from, and that's going to be the name of the old folder path. So Control and Space again, old folder path. 
Now there is one other way, one other syntax you can use to call other subroutines. So rather than just stating the name of the subroutine, you can actually optionally put the word call at the start of the phrase. Now the only difference in using call and not using call is that if you do use the call keyword, you must then close the argument list in a set of parentheses. So this won't work unless I put round brackets around the old folder path. But that genuinely is the only difference between call and not call. So, one last little tweak I'm going to make as well, just to prove that this works in the same way as it, it did previously. I'm going to change my old folder path back to files for course, as it was originally. And then, I'm going to go back to my Windows Explorer window. I'm going to go to the WiseAl folder. I'm going to make sure that I've deleted all of the files in there, just to prove that it does actually still work in the way it was intended. So let's delete all those old copies of those files. So the WiseAl folder is blank. The VBA files files for course folder contains lots of Excel files along with other ones as well. So I'm just going to quickly test this to make sure that it actually works. So back to the VB editor. Um, I'm just going to run this. I'm not going to step through this one. I'm just going to run it from start to finish. So hit the run button go back to the YSL folder, and there's the copy of all those Excel files again. Now at this point, we appear to have put in quite a lot of effort for no apparent benefit. Um, we've effectively got two separate subroutines which do the same job that one did previously. But that's because we haven't done the clever bit yet. So here it is. What I'd like to do in the second subroutine, once I've finished listing out the files or copying the files from one particular folder, and I've finished looping over those files, I'd then like to look at any subfolder in that same folder and then do the same job. So to make that work, I'm going to declare another variable. I'm going to say dim subfol as scripting.folder. Once I've done that, heading back down to the bottom of this subroutine, once I've finished looping over the files collection of the original folder, I'm then going to say for each subfol in old folder I spell that properly, in old folder, dot subfolders. So each folder object, as well as having a files collection, also contains a subfolders collection. And each object in the subfolders collection is just another scripting.folder. So if I just finish off this loop and I say next subfold, let's work out what we want to do inside the loop. So what I want to do for each subfolder in the subfolders collection is loop over all of the files in there, checking for the Excel ones and copying them out to the new folder, and then loop over all the subfolders in that folder as well. So essentially, the instructions that I want to carry out are essentially the same as the subroutine that I'm in the middle of writing. So this is the very strange bit, but the very clever bit. What we're going to do is we're going to call the subroutine that we're in the middle of writing. We're going to call copy Excel files. I'm going to pass into this um, call to the subroutine the name of the subfolder or the path of the subfolder. So we can do that by saying subfold.path. So there we go. That's the whole thing. That, that's the only extra bit of code we needed to add to make this whole system work to recurse through every single folder and subfolder at the starting path. This technique is called recursive programming. It's whenever you, you write a routine which calls itself. I'm going to show you how this works in just a moment, but just to prove that it does actually do the job now. Returning back to the first subroutine, let's just replace our original old folder path to the top level VBA files folder. Then if I click into there, just to quickly show you in the WiseR folder at the moment, there are only 10 items. So 10 items. If I go back to the VB editor and I click into this subroutine and run it, It'll take a little bit longer to run because it's looping through lots of different file uh, folders and subfolders. But once it's happened, and I go back to the WiseAl folder, we should find many, many more files in there. Essentially, every single Excel file which exists in that folder. So it goes through every single folder and subfolder through there. So hopefully you'll agree that recursive code can be very powerful and immensely useful as well. Uh, but it can be quite tricky to follow what's going on when you're stepping through the subroutines in particular. So there's a couple of useful tools you can use to help you out when you're doing this. I'm going to display one on screen at this point. I'm going to view the locals window and that will appear at the bottom of the screen. It'll be empty for the moment, but that's OK. We'll come back to that in a moment. The other thing I'd like to show you, the other tool I can't actually display at this point, it's called the call stack. And you can see it's greyed out at this point because I'm not actually stepping through any subroutines.
So I'm going to start stepping through the original sub using the scripting runtime library, and you'll see the locals window gets populated immediately with any locally declared variables, like old folder path. What I can then do is, while I'm stepping through a routine, I can also choose to view the call stack. And what the call stack does is it shows you a list of all of the open and running subroutines at this point. So I've only got one open and running, it's the one that I've just begun, obviously, using the scripting runtime library. So I'm going to close that window down and then carry on stepping through until I get to the point where I call my copy Excel files subroutine. So as soon as I hit F8 to do that, the locals window updates to show me um, things that are declared locally to this new subroutine. So you can see that uh, I've got start folder path, which is a, uh, a parameter of that subroutine. That's set to VBA files. If I also go back to the call stack at this point as well, you can see that I've actually got another open subroutine. So it's called the stack and each new subroutine goes to the top of the stack. So things stack up and the more subroutines you have running, the taller the stack, of course. So, if I close that window down and carry on pressing F8 to step through, um, so in the VBA files folder, there actually aren't any individual files. So we'll see that this first loop to loop over the files collection there will not do anything because there aren't any files to loop over. So it jumps straight to the next loop, which loops over all the subfolders in there. So it's going to start with the arguments folder, because that's the first folder that's in the VBA files folder. When I hit F8 to execute this line, I've actually opened up now a third subroutine. So again, view the call stack, and it shows me that I'm in another subroutine. So I've got a third sub open and running. It looks like when you're stepping through that the subroutine you're currently running just goes back to a different point, but that's not quite the same thing. We're not going back to a previous point of the first subroutine, or the second subroutine, should I say. We're actually just opening up another new copy of the same program. And that's what the call stack shows you, that you've actually got more than one copy of the same subroutine running. So as I step through this one, we'll print out uh, or copy two different files, because there are two Excel files in the arguments folder. And then it moves on to the next subfolder in the arguments folder. So I'll just quickly show you that. There aren't any folders in that folder. So, if I go back to Excel, uh, sorry, back to the VB editor, when I end that subroutine, I'm going to press F8 now. If I view the call stack again now, it'll show me that one of those two copies of the copy Excel files subroutines has closed down. So it's back to the previous one now. So essentially, I'm in the copy that's looping over all the subfolders in VBA files. I'm just going to close and I'm going to end the subroutine at that point because it's going to get very boring watching me step through the entire sequence. But you can see the call stack growing and shrinking as you open up more copies of the same routines. And the longer the sequence of folders in a, in a particular branch, so for instance, if I find the files for course, file set folder, so there's a sequence of three nested folders in that folder, you'll see more copies of the copy Excel file subroutine open in the call stack. So we've seen various techniques now for working with files and folders, all going back to the idea of referencing the scripting runtime library, which is incredibly useful because it gives us access to the wonderful file system object class, which has lots and lots of really useful methods and properties for working with files and folders. Hopefully you'll be able to start using some of these in your own code now, and hopefully you found the video useful. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this training video, you can find many more online training resources at www.wisel.co.uk.